Well, shops in England reopen on Monday. How will it work? Gok One joins the coronavirus newscast. That's in an hour. First on BBC One, lots to talk about. Welcome to Question Time on tonight's panel. Robert Buckland, the government's Justice Secretary, formerly Solicitor General for England and Wales and Prisons Minister. Joining us down the line from Cardiff, Labour's Health Minister at the Senate, previously the youngest ever president of the Welsh TUC, Vaughan Gething. Liz Savile Roberts, elected as an MP in 2015, currently the leader of Clyde Cymru in the House of Commons. Rocco Forte, a hotelier with the business in his blood. He worked with his father at the start of his career and in 1996 started his own group of luxury hotels from Scotland to Shanghai. And prolific author, professor of creative writing at Brunel University and joint winner of last year's Booker Prize for her novel Girl, Woman, Other, Bernadine Evaristo. Good evening. Welcome, of course, to my guests here in the studio, uh, to Vaughan Gething joining us down the line. And, of course, to our audience, virtual audience, thank you very much for being here. You are joining us from Cardiff and the Cardiff area. It's very lovely to have you with us. And, of course, if you want to join in the conversation, you can uh, contact the programme at BBC Question Time on social media and be part of the conversation. So let's start with our first question tonight from our virtual audience, uh, Tessa Marshall. OK, so in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests, will the panel commit to educating the citizens of the UK about the atrocities of the British Empire, take down the statues and the portraits that represent slave traders um, in the UK and people who profited from empire, really? Um, and will you apologise for paying off the owners of slaves, um, a debt that the British people were paying off until as late as 2015? Uh, Robert? Well, I think we've got to confront our history, warts and all. And whilst there are many things we can be proud about with regard to Britain and its history, there are, uh, there's a lot that we need to confront and be honest about that is bad about our history. But I think that applying today's standards to what may have happened many hundreds of years ago is a difficult concept, to say the least. And I think rather than using the language of blame and apology, we should be being honest about it, being forthright about it, using democratic processes wherever possible to deal with it. So let's take, for example, particular statues to slave traders that might be in Bristol or elsewhere. Use the democratic process to, uh, through a proper decision, decide what to do with that particular memorial or statue. So do you think that people were wrong to, 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 to tear it down, then? I think they were. I think that uh, whilst I absolutely get and understand the huge strength of feeling that's been engendered as a result of that appalling incident in Minneapolis and the fact that many people have just had enough, and I get that utterly, I do think that we all owe it to each other to respect the rule of law and to, within that, work for greater equality. And I think the scenes that we saw in Bristol were disturbing in the sense that there didn't seem to be that sense of order. I mean, your justice, like... your justice Secretary, do you want to see those people prosecuted? Well, I, I think an investigation is ongoing and we've got to let the police do their job independently and let the prosecuting authorities follow the evidence wherever it leads. But the point I'm making is that if we stand for something together and collectively in this great country, it's got to be the rule of law and those f values of freedom that attracted so many people here in the first place and make this country, whilst it is imperfect and whilst there's a huge amount for us to do, a, a good place to live because we have that underpinning of the rule of law and democracy. Let's celebrate that, but let's be honest and confront the past as well. And let me just... T Tessa, when you said that the, you want the government to apologise for reparations paid to countries until 2015 for slavery, what are you referring to? So, yeah, so the debt that, was, um, that we were paying off refers to the £20 million um, pounds that was paid off to slave owners um, when slavery became illegal in 1837. Um, and so that debt is something that the British government was paying off until as late as 2015. 
Robert? Well, look, I think the history of our islands is always with us. But were and, we paying off that debt until um, 2015? I think, actually, the lady is right, because I've read reports that similarly seems... about that. that seems but I think she makes a very powerful point about the fact that you cannot escape history. And I think it would be fundamentally dishonest of us to, uh, through removing statues and airbrushing out history, to then pretend that all was well. Do you know, totalitarian regimes do that. Uh, and communist regimes and other extreme regimes do that sort of thing and then pretend that all is well. No, we okay. need to be honest, face up to it and accept the fact we are as much prisoners of our history uh, as, uh, as anything else. But we have a chance through democracy to break free and progress. Bernadine. Yes, um, I, I totally disagree with you, actually, um, because I absolutely relish that um, statue being toppled, you know, um, in Bristol. They had tried for decades to either get the statue removed or to um, get a plaque put on the statue to provide the context for um, Colston's... Um, you know, history as a slave trader. And we, we, I think everybody now knows that he was culpable in terms of some 80,000 Africans being enslaved in the New World and 20,000 of those Africans were also lost at sea. So I think he's, he's a, he was a really toxic symbol in Bristol and it was really important that he should go or at least be contextualised, and people tried to do that, and they tried for decades, they didn't get anywhere with it. So it felt to me that it was totally right that they should topple that statue, because of what he represented. And I'm totally for a lot of the other statues in this country being removed and perhaps recontextualised in museums or somewhere where we actually understand what role they played in society in a wider sense. And, and the, the whole idea about... And which kind of statues... For example, um, so there was somebody removed from outside the Museum of London, for example. Yes, I mean, Robert Milligan. There's who's also a, an a, argument, a isn't there, about trader. Lord Nelson? You know, <laughs> who is such a sort of totemic figure, literally in this country. And would you want to see his his statue come off? Well, I think we need to have that Nelson's conversation, column? probably. But um, there, there is also this argument that's come up in terms of the statues that we can't change history and that it is the history of this country. But actually, history is a construction. OK, events happen, we have a past, and then historians contextualise that past and interrogate it. And what's happened in this country is that, you know, it, historically that has been done by white, uh, elite white men who have been the historians who have set the framework for the events of the past. So history is something that needs to be challenged and re-interrogated -inter and revised constantly. And removing those statues is, a set, in, in a sense, it's, it's giving power to the people who really do object to a symbol of their historical slavery and all their allies as well. Um, the, the other thing about history is that history has always excluded pr primarily women and people of colour and working class people and LGBTQ plus people in the ways in which it's been told. And that also goes to what you were saying about the colonial history. You know, a lot of people in this country don't understand the colonial history or they understand it through a certain prism, where they, they, they feel that Britain went and travelled all over the world in order to help people. You know, there, there is still a section of society who don't think slavery was a really bad thing. So I think it's really important that we interrogate history. And when you have to take the law into your own hands and remove a statue, I mean, God, nobody died. You know, it's just this little tin statue, whatever it was, that was thrown into the river. And it then led to this conversation that we're having now about the rest of the relics of Britain's murky past. Then I think it's really important. And when Tessa talks about removing statues or portraits of, of anyone who has profited from empire... Well, then, where, I'm, I'm sort of wondering, I mean, that's where, where, that's the where country. does that... That's yes, the country, exactly. Isn't it? But I think the visual symbols, the statues are really toxic and re they really are an, aff an affront to our shared humanity. And I think, I think at least we need to look at that. And, and you know, Britain was built on, on the wealth of slavery and colonialism. That's the truth. Um, and we don't really admit that. Rocco. Well, I, um, uh, there's a quote uh, of, uh, of Nelson Mandela's, who's hiding our history is not the route to enlightenment. We have to understand our history and we have to confront it. And I, I agree very much with what uh, Robert 
what uh, Buckland uh, was saying, that we can't uh, judge the past by the values of today. And it seems that people are trying to uh, uh, use the evil of slavery to rewrite uh, the history of this country uh, and, uh, and, and, and try and negate the heritage that this country, that this country has. Um, so do you, think it, do you think it was wrong to take down the statue of yes, Edward Clark? Well, I think it's wrong to take it down in that, in that way. And I think any vandalism of any kind is completely unacceptable. It's, a, it's against the law and it's disgraceful that the police, uh, when they're not there in sufficient numbers, uh, to, to prevent, that, pre prevent that happening. I mean, people have worst, made comparisons... The worst, the, worst, the worst aspect for me of the, uh, of the, uh, of the London uh, demonstration, uh, seeing police running away from demonstrators in fear, that's a breakdown of law and order, and it's more brutal, and it's completely unacceptable. And when you talk about vandalism, for example, I mean, one, one example that's been quoted is, is, and I'm not equating the two, but the Berlin Wall, for example, which obviously people just pulled down themselves and the police stood by and just let it happen. Well, I mean, that's... But that's, that's, I'm, I'm, that's not, I'm not trying to say the two are the same, but nonetheless, aren't, aren't, aren't nonetheless, aren't it was... In any it was, way, in any well, way comparable. no, but the, the no, argument that no, is made the, is that it, know, it was, it was, I mean, it was something that, that people took upon themselves about, to do. Uh, uh, statues of long forgotten people at a time when the country's sleepwalking to economic disaster and our children have been prevented from going to school. Well, we may well come to that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll deal with the, one, one the, thing at a time. No, it's, 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 it, uh, it's mind boggling. OK, well, let, let's talk to some of our virtual audience got their hands up. Sin. I think it's important that as a society we look at the past, um, but we don't need to glorify or celebrate the events of the past that we as a nation took part in. I agree that statues that have links to the past, so that bear issues um, relating to slavery, do need to be taken down. I'm not asking for them to be hidden. I think they need to be in a museum um, because museums are great places to educate and help remember the past. Um, maybe even have history about British colonialism or um, minority ethnic communities in the curriculum. I think that would be an important step that we could take as a society. Theon? So I was just going to say, I agree completely with what Birdstein and Avrisa said about um, the fact that in Bristol, I went to university in Bristol and for years, you know, it has been a topic of discussion to take it down. And, you know, the voice of the whole democratic thing that we're saying is, well, people have been asking to take that down and people have been ignoring it. So in some way, somebody's been saying, well, no, actually, I need to stay up there. So who were they trying to protect there? They're trying to protect the name of you know, they're trying to show that this actually should stay and you say that it's disturbing the way it was taken down. If you think about the people that it's affected or the ancestors of the people that walk past it every day, it would not be disturbing to see someone glorified when they have killed thousands of people and are being sort of celebrated in a way so publicly. So I just don't agree exactly with what Rocco or what the Justice Secretary had to say there, that it's disturbing or that in some way it's anyway worse than going to the democratic way when there's still people trying to justify what that man did. Elaine? Hi. Um, I, I, I like the idea of Tessa's second part of the question because there will be um, equal measures on both sides. I'm really interested in how we'll all come together and have a critical conversation about how we can go forward with this um, issue. Well, let me come to, to John uh, Williams on that. John, you, you, you wanted to take this <coughs> question forward. Uh, yes. Um, so, will a possible taking down of 60 statues in the UK advance the cause of Black Lives Matter? So, Vaughan, I mean, this just leads on really from Tessa's question. Whether or not taking the statues down is, is productive, whether you approved of what happened in Bristol, and, and is it perhaps obscuring a larger or helping a larger discussion? Well, I'm pleased that John's made his point in his question, because what I was going to say to the original question was that, yes, I do think some of those statues need to come down, and others that stay up, I think, need greater context about who those figures were. But the Black Lives Matter campaign is not a campaign uh, to, 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 to re-engineer our public space and remove statues. It's actually not even about the death of George Ford. It's about the persistent and continuing 
racial inequalities that affect not just America, but other countries around the world, including our own. And that's the point. Uh, and I think within that, this is only one small part of the debate we need to have as a, as a, as a group of countries, but then also the action that we need to take. And all of us are painfully familiar with the fact that criminal justice outcomes are different if you look like me compared to Robert. They're different in terms of what happens to you in terms of mental health services too. That's the sort of action that I think we need to see taken and not get too led down a blind alley here. And in doing that, it's not just examining our distant past, it's not even about trying to rewrite our histories, understanding our history to help build our future. And the way politicians talk about this matters. So I think the Prime Minister would be in a better position to do his job if he recognised that at the start of the 21st century, talking about watermelon smiles and piccaninnies was not helpful. It was an empty at the time. The same for the leader of Pride coming with some of the offensive comments he's made in the recent past too. We can all learn from this and take the opportunity of this extraordinary global movement to reset not just our view on our past, but much more importantly, to make changes to our shared future. And, and Liz, obviously you want to respond to what uh, uh, Vaughan has said, but also just looking at John and Tessa's questions, they're so in a sense two sides of the same coin. You know, should we be, be taking statues down, por remove portraits, uh, commemorating people who, who had profited from slavery or profited from the empire, Tessa is saying, or, or should we be, is that in a sense counterproductive in terms of looking at the bigger issue? I think certainly this is a time where, and I look back to my, the time when I was raised in Eltham, and the, the terrible, appalling murder of, of Stephen Lawrence. And at, at that time, it drove many establishment changes, but it evidently did not drive enough. We know that. We know that we live in a racist society. Now, there's one thing that I just could refer back to what Vaughan said, and this is a little bit disappointing, because, frankly, Vaughan, I think we are trying to fight from the same corner here. And you do know that Plaid Cymru, of course, Adam Price has called for a, an inquiry into structural racism in Wales. It was in response to his uh, questioning that the First Minister of Wales responded with the, with the, with the, with the, the concept, supporting the concept of a, a black and minority ethnic museum in Wales. And also it's been Plaid Cymru who's been leading on perhaps the major point, which is changes to the curriculum. But what Vaughan's because referring to is, is, is obviously Adam's, uh, Adam Price <coughs> apologised for, for the, the, the referring, co comparing made, Wales yeah. to a kind of colonial but, but think, outpost. Yeah. When we're looking at the real big issues of politics, one of the rather petty things that we do in politics in the United Kingdom is bring it down to personalities. And these are big, serious it questions. Matters. Now, looking at the statues, and I raised this yesterday with the Prime Minister, of course, what we have within the United Kingdom is the way of presenting history very much through the eyes of the Conservatives. And the Prime Minister, when I asked him on this question, is that Conservatives don't pull down statues, Conservatives don't pull down statues. It was the imagery of the past, and yet, and I know that um, the Lord Chancellor will, will agree with this, we have much legislation in place to deal with, with, with racial hatred, but we know that we still live within a racial a society which, which acts upon racialism so, and racism. So the question that I have for us now is how are we going to bring about the big social changes, the big changes in attitudes? That's why the statues are so interesting, because they are so symbolic of a certain sort of history that said the empire was fine, that the British Empire was a force for good and a force for good only in the world. This is not true. And now is the time to come to recognise that it isn't just the history of powerful white men who often made their money and their fortunes out of the sufferings of others. Now is the time for the voice of the others to come through. And that is my hope for the future. But the fact that we're having this discussion here, it has to go beyond the usual talking heads of politicians and get into our curriculum and really change people's attitudes. Mm. OK, Taya? Slavery uh, has bred racism. As a person responsible in a responsible position, I can't even bring myself to repeat what some politicians, including our prime minister, has said in the past about ethnic minorities. I've been reading history at uh, AS level, revising with my son, who didn't do his uh, proper exam, but I've read about Pit to Peel. The curriculum needs to change. The War of Independence is depicted as the Indian mutiny. That needs mm -hmm. to change, mm -hmm. especially children who are born and bred over here. My son considers himself as Welsh. 
And for him to read history in a different manner than what I have read and what I've read recently, I think it's important that violence should be condemned, but racism from top down needs to be dealt with. I'm very uh, proud to live in uh, Cardiff and work in uh, Cardiff for the last 25 years. It's a multicultural uh, society, but we need to make sure that from town, uh, top down, from Boris downwards, we need to deal with this uh, racism. Uh, Robert, what... I mean, we heard the Prime Minister talk about this at Prime Minister's Questions yesterday. He, the, the comment he made about picking and he's waving at the Queen and watermelon and spines has come back time and time again to haunt him. What, what, what are we going to see from the government, if anything? And, you know, Prime Minister, who was mayor of probably the most cosmopolitan city in the world and was elected twice, uh, and whose uh, approach to issues of migration and multiculturalism has been open, liberal and inclusive. And his remarks uh, in the aftermath of the uh, unlawful killing of George Floyd, I think, were uh, appropriate. They uh, struck the right tone and he talked in a positive way about what needed to be done. So I think absolutely we have the right approach. I think that sense of trying to bring people together is what we need now. Uh, and I think a lot of the remarks, I think, are, are on the money when it comes to the fact that rather than focusing upon icons and statues, actions speak far louder than words. And Vaughan has made the point about the criminal justice system. I have responsibility for that in England and Wales. I absolutely take responsibility for the need to improve the way in which we deal with black and minority ethnic people in that system. And there's a whole range of things that we are doing. No, no time to go into them now, but the sort of practical measures that we've got to do to make Could the experience different. Could I ask one specific different. question there, please? Um, the black population in Wales is overrepresented by five times within the prison population of Wales. Surely that is a desperate failure. That is an indication of the racism of our society in action. Would you, as the Secretary of State for Justice, commit to using that as a target to reduce that percentage, that unacceptable percentage within the prison population, specifically in Wales? But, of course, it applies throughout England and Wales entirely. Well, what I commit to, Liz, is making sure that uh, the problems that are inherited by the criminal justice system are dealt with further up the line. Uh, and the diversions that are needed in order to help people uh, uh, of that background not to get into the system in the first place are what we're going to have to do. And that's not just me, that's education, that's health, that's housing. That's the whole apparatus of government in Wales and in Westminster actually coming together round the problem and the individual rather than this silo approach that means that I end up being responsible for a system with a disproportionate number of young people from that background within it. Bernadine, I just are think you... that merely mask refusal to engage in the reality the Prime Minister said something deeply offensive at the start of the 21st century, it is a real issue. For people that look like me, having a Prime Minister who used the language of watermelon smiles and piccaninnies, it matters. Just as someone comparing the experience of Wales to colonialism and the African-American experience, it matters and it's offensive. And if we want to move on, you've got to accept that that isn't acceptable and you gain credit for yourselves and your parties, and actually the healing that I want to see take place right across the United Kingdom, if you only acknowledge what is staring you in the face. Because it isn't just the fact that I'm a politician, I'm this colour every day of the week, every single day of the year. And it matters to me that we are spoken about and treated in a way that reflects who we are and not the colour of our skin. So use language that matters and make sure you're not making these mean amount of apologies for things that are plainly wrong. I think that, you know, I find Boris... I found Boris offensive um, all along with his journalism in The Spectator, with the racist things that he said. Uh, when he became mayor of London, yes, he became mayor of, a, of a, an incredibly multicultural city, but one of the first things he tried to do was to get rid of Black History Month. Right? So we're talking here about the importance of history and acknowledging the past and also we should be celebrating um, the, the entire population, people of colour and our contribution to this society. We've been here since the Romans, it's something I've written about. Um, and we have a, a mayor 
who tries to get rid of the, the single thing that we do to bring to the wider public the fact that we have a history. And in fact, the, the truth is, of course, black history is British history. This is a multicultural country and always has been. Um, and British history is world history because we had an empire that, that ruled over a quarter of the world for a very long time. So I, I, I really don't accept you apologising or, or trying to, um, you know, to present Boris Johnson in a good light because I found him deeply offensive. Robert, do you want to respond? I'm going to move on and move. Do you want to respond to that? This well, is the Prime Minister, after all. Look, this is the leader of your party. I would say that uh, journalists write lots of things and write lots of polemic and lots of things that they would later not come to regret and not choose to do now. I would say this, that... Has the Prime Minister um, ever said that he regretted using those terms? Uh, look, I, I can't speak for him about what might have been written 15 or so years ago. I've got to judge the person on his actions as an elected politician. And what I've seen is somebody who absolutely understands the challenges we face, accepts them, faces up to them, and wants to do something about them. OK. All right. Let's... This is a subject we could talk about for the entire programme, I know. There are lots of other questions that came in as well on other things, so I'm just going to move on now to Rosina Allen. Hello. Um, good evening. Um, like myself uh, and many other independent restaurants, our restaurant is very much family-based, and, and five of our family members are dependent on that business. Since COVID-19 has come around, social distancing seems to be inevitable in hospitality. Once lockdown is lifted, we imagine 25 to 50% of our capacity will only be achieved. Um, and we feel that only fixed costs may be covered or may not be covered. In the short term and the long term, what strategies will the government and stakeholder organisations put forward for our industry, taking into account there's so much debt already being created by independent family businesses now. And Rosina, you mentioned uh, social distancing. Of course, we're, we're, we're two metres uh, in, in this country is, is the acceptable social distancing. Uh, Rock, I'm going to come to you, obviously, first with your hotel business. Well, uh, yes, I mean, it, 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 this, this, uh, this two metre social distancing rule has sort of come out of the blue. There's no scientific evidence behind it. The WTO has just come out and said, if you're two metres away, you have a 1% chance of catching the disease. And if you're, uh, if you're one metre away, you have a 3% chance of, uh, of, of catching the disease. This is the, uh, the WHO, the World yes, Health Organisation. Yes, the WHO. The, 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 um, the, uh, the reality in continental Europe, which has started to open up, is that they've, 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 they've gone back to, to, one, to one metre. Some of them. Uh, well, some of them, not all of them yeah. have, but yes, some of them have. Yeah, a lot, so a lot you've got. Of them so what have we got? We've so got China. Italy has and Germany has and uh, uh, Germany's at one and a half meters, uh, as is Italy. France and Denmark are, are at one meter at the moment. And Spain is higher. The, um, so, so, and the I mean, the reality of this whole this whole thing is, it's a, it's a, no one is concentrating on the econo on economic impacts of this. And the reality of this disease, which at first was thought to be a terrible disease and was going to kill uh, hundreds, millions of people, it's not, it's, it's not turned out to be like that. Uh, there's, the, from the, 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 a lot of the surveys that have been done show that it's 0.1 to 0.2 per cent of people who die if they catch the disease. And the reality well, there, there are other suggestions is, is 1%, mm -hmm. and, and in some countries, higher. Well, I, I don't know. The, but no, I mean, the, the, the only, the, the, the only uh, thorough research that's been done was one done by Stanford on the New York epidemic, which is one of the hotbeds in, in, in the United States, and it's come out with these, with these figures. The... the um, um, so the reality of, uh, of this disease is that it hits... The average age of people who've died in this country is 80. A, th a third of them have died in, in the care homes. It's a disgrace what's <laughs> happened in the, uh, in, in, in the care homes. But, it's yeah, but, but, that's... but when it comes to, 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 to the hospitality industry, for example, yeah. and obviously Rosine is talking about her, her restaurant here, if, if the government sticks with this two-metre <laughs> uh, social distancing, 
is it going to be viable for you, for example, to, to open? No, you've got hotels around the world, isn't. but to well, be open in this country. A number of aspects to, to hotels opening and so on. A lot of hotels in this country depend on international travel. If there's no international travel, they won't have customers. They won't be able to uh, to, to to open. So you're opposing the quarantine as well. Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean the quarantine is again. There's no, it's got no scientific evidence behind it. Uh, the chief scientific officer says it's a political decision, not a scientific decision. Uh, we, we're closing down when the rest of Europe is opening, opening up. Until Sunday, you could come from Iran or Brazil, the two highest hotbeds of the disease, uh, and uh, with, with, with impunity. And all of a sudden, on Sunday evening, no one can come in. So, can I just ask you? So, with your hotels, where in other countries where it's the distancing is a meter or one and a half meters, can you open? Yeah, well, uh, economically uh, profitably well, with that uh, kind of social distancing. Meter. It's still difficult, but a meter makes it makes it possible. Um, I mean, the the the, 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 the tourism industry uh, has suffered disproportionately. Effectively, it's been without income since March, and will continue to be to, without income in this country till July. So that's four months, a third of the year. And it's important, you know, the, the, every, uh, many, many businesses in, in the tourism industry will go under. You impose quarantine, which stops foreigners coming, coming into this country, just, uh, just in, when there was a chance to save something out of the, out of the summer season. Uh, uh, it's another nail, nail in the coffin. The two-metre rule makes it impossible for people, for people to, to open properly. Well, Vaughan, when it comes to Wales, uh, the, the First Minister has, has, has said he doesn't expect most of Welsh tourism uh, to be running this summer at all. Best hope self-catering. So what do you think in, in, in response to what Rosina said and what... Uh, Rocco Fortis had to say. Well, it's difficult, but I'm very proud of the fact that our government in Wales has as our priority how we keep Wales safe. <laughs> We've taken a deliberately cautious approach to easing out of lockdown because I simply disagree with Rocco's characterization of COVID-19 and its impact. It is a dreadful disease. It's taken thousands of extra lives, tens of thousands across the UK, and it would have taken many more if we hadn't impose lockdown when we did. Uh, and I don't think you can try to balance off health against the economy. If we come out of lockdown too quickly, we'll not see lives lost, we'll see a much greater impact upon our economy. So we are looking at the range of measures that we take, which are the signal that want to have more economic activity take place, but to do so unashamedly on the basis that we got to this in the safest way possible. And that does mean necessary caution. So, so how can you help, help Rosina? We have, a two -meter rule, we have a two metre rule in our regulations. So you have to consider that. And we're not about to change the law on that because I think there's good <laughs> evidence actually that you are safer. You have double the risk having a one metre rule as opposed to a two metre rule. Well, the scientific uh, advisory group on emergencies advised all the governments okay. of the UK on that, and I'm not about to risk the lives of our citizens on the basis of Rocco's suggestion. I mean, so, so the obviously conclusion of that is Rosina's business might go to the wall. Rosina, you've got, you've got your hand up. Let's hear from you again. I'm not saying about <laughs> reducing the um, the social distancing of two metres. If that's the law, that's law. And I think if you even if you reduce it to one metre. I don't think that would make a lot of difference because I think in the mind of the consumer it's very much scorched in about the two metre rule, rule about staying away from other people. I think even if you reduced it to half a metre, I think people are going to stay away. Yeah, okay. So uh, least... our dilemma is not just in the next week or the next two weeks or the next month. I think this is a much, much longer long term problem yeah. that the hospitality are going to have. Yeah. Lisa Marie. Hi, sorry. Uh, in Wales, uh, more than 95% of our businesses are smaller micro businesses. And at the moment, there are zero uh, emissions going into Gwent and there are really low emissions going into Heath Hospital. So there's no evidence really to suggest keeping a lockdown in place. But also, have the government really taken into account what impact this is going to have on all these small businesses and our economy in Wales, which could be severely affected if we keep some of these guidelines in place? Shaquille? Just wanted to ask, um, once furlough has ended, should we prepare for mass redundancies for businesses mm. that can no longer function in the new normal? And let me hear from John. Well, the, the economy in Wales has always been a house of cards. We're very dependent on the public sector. And we should have been leading the way in reopening, but we're not. We, we are forever 
days, weeks behind what Westminster is doing. And really, the, the Welsh Assembly sits on its hands for three weeks in between throwing out a few little tidbits of, uh, of very, very minor, trivial relaxing. Um, Robert, looking at the situation in England, we had the Business mm. Secretary, Alok Sharma, warning that <coughs> three and a half million jobs are at risk in the hospitality sector. The government's coming I'm under a lot of pressure for Conservative MPs to do more for business, do more for businesses like Rosina's, and in particular reduce this two metre mm. distance. Any chance of that happening? Well, look, I think Rosina actually makes a really important point about the confidence that people will have. And, you know, governments will have regulations and uh, have plans and guidance, but without that confidence, then, uh, you know, th other things will happen. And I think she's right to remind us that this isn't going to be something that we'll have an end date to and that all will be well. We have, of course, extended things like the furlough scheme into October. I think in Wales, about 4 418,000 people have been supported through various government schemes, which is welcome. <coughs> But this isn't a problem for uh, weeks or months. This is a problem that's going to endure for a much longer period. I think within government, we're right to have the debate. In fact, the debate is ha happening across the country because, as you've said, there are different in international standards. But I do think it's right that we uh, stick to the lath on two metres. We've got to be clear about that. Clarity is something that people uh, demand from government. And uh, whilst it's uh, right of us to consider the evidence and to constantly evaluate and question and make adjustments. The two-metre rule certainly stays uh, for the foreseeable. I think with regard to it's the other measures... It's confusing, though, isn't it, given that some countries are going for a metre, yeah. the WHO I, is suggesting a metre, and then you've got other countries going for one and a half metre. People are wondering... Well, I know. Where, where's this? I mean, it's all one science. So, where, where's the? Where, how is that decision made? I think Fiona, it's, it's a question of two stages: the, the evidence and the advice that you get from Sage and the scientists forms part of a decision making that is ultimately political. The two-stage approach to it, and there will be a number of different factors in that. I think the the challenge for government now, as we come out of this period of you know really intense lockdown, is how to get the combination right. And that's why there's been a big debate about the quarantine. Clearly, at the time of the, high, the height of the outbreak, quarantine would have made no difference. But now, the advice that we get is that even small adjustments can affect that R rate. And therefore, it's a constant evaluation to see what adjustments we can make to help people in Rosina's position and to get the balance right between the need to open up but the need to save lives as well. Bernadine? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. So, you know, if the hospitality industry does open up, as, as you would like, Rocco, how, how do you keep people safe? You know, you can't open up with social distancing, so how do you keep people safe? Yeah, but I think it's up to, it's up to the consumer to, to decide what he wants, wants to do. I mean, people have been terrified by the government propaganda, and made, which, in a way, that will, that's gradually breaking down already. You see it with the people on the beaches, you see it with people <coughs> on the parks. They're not social distancing and too and two metres. The only place I've seen it happening is here tonight. It's, it's, it's it, not just, well, and we're doing but, it very well, you know, but it's the, not just it, propaganda, Rocco. We're talking about the economy. The economy, it's not quite about quite the, the economy, it's about the livelihoods of millions of people. We're not talking about thousands here, we're talking about millions of people who are going to lose their jobs uh, and, and, and their families, and it'll affect their health. And, and, and everything else. You can't just say, well, sweep it aside, or it's just the, uh, just the economy. What about the resorts in Wales, like Rill, Dundadno, uh, Porthcawl, which, which depend entirely on a summer season? Those people are not going to be able to, to, to function. They're not going to survive. They've had one winter, they've, they're, going to, they, they, they're going into another winter, and the summer wind, should have, which should have lifted them up, is not going to be there if you carry on like this. So but, those, all those businesses are going to be devastated. But it's it also... Yeah, it, with it, all the jobs that go with them. It, it's not just propaganda. Obviously, I think you know, people are confused by the different information that's coming out. You talked about this I know. This, this report from Stanford, 0.1 to 0.2%. Yeah, but I mean, German, but let me just say, that, that was not peer-reviewed, as I expect you know. And other scientists have come out with, with different figures in terms of statistics I mean, for deaths coming from coronavirus. The German... Me, the yeah. German... The German uh, there's a report by uh, experts in the German government, which was leaked, uh, which says that the, the, uh, the German reaction, the German government's reaction was completely <laughs> over the top, was unnecessary, 
they compared it to the 1718, uh, 2017 18 influenza epidemic, which killed one and a half million people across the world. It killed 25,000 people in Germany, 28,000 in this country. And the, the economy of the world was not locked down. I rem, uh, I, I, in, in 68, when I was 23, we had the Hong Kong flu. That killed over a million people worldwide. We had 80,000 in this country. I don't remember anything about it. It wasn't talked about. And yet we are still at 63,000 excess deaths for this time. And we are the highest country in Europe for deaths. Now, one of the things that the public knows, and people to make their own responses, and this is one of the reasons, I think, why people are still keeping to the two metres themselves. It is, it is, Professor Neil Ferguson has said it, we went into lockdown too late, and we went into lockdown too late because Boris Johnson likes to think that he will let people do what they want to do, and he is reluctant to take criticism of this. Now, here in Wales, I <coughs> deeply fear when the furlough scheme is starting to scale down. It starts to scale down in August, when businesses are uh, responsible for taking on their national insurance and their pensions. We have 74% of our businesses are dependent, are using the furlough scheme. So, and of course, I represent an area, Duivo Merioneth, which is deeply dependent on, on the tourism industry. And, and, and I fear what is going to happen with that industry. I and mean, I talk to people like the, the, the Festiniog Railway, an absolute jewel in the crown, the heritage railways in North Wales, absolute jewel in the crown. They are facing what they call the three winter scenario. And when the furlough scheme ceases, regardless of what Welsh Government says, because Welsh Government hasn't got the means of funding their own policies, they are going to be facing the situation and many, many other businesses where they'll be making redundancies this summer. This is the three winter scenario. Now, to come back to the question of public confidence, because in the heel of the hunt, it'll be public confidence that changes this. We need an effective test and trace system in place that is seen by people to work both in Wales and in England and until people have that confidence then we're going to see the same problem coming up alongside this I beg both our governments the Welsh government and the UK government the English government in this respect look at what's happening to our tourism and hospitality industry look at our dependence on this they, these people will go out of business and there will be immense suffering in the terms of unemployment. Please do not pull the wool over our eyes. We need these industries into the future and I fear what will happen this summer. Well, you mentioned testing, Liz. Let, there's, we have a question on that from Shaquille. Hi. Uh, OK, so we've recruited 25,000 contact tracers. However, with today's uh, test and trace results showing that a third of the people who are testing positive are not providing any details for those close contacts. Is the system good enough uh, and is it up to scratch? Um, Robert, also I'm going to come to you on that because we've had the, the figures out uh, today from the Health Secretary Matt Hancock. Vaughan, let me just start with you. I mean, contact tracing has been in, happening in Wales for some period of time, but what we don't know, I think, is how many people are actually being contacted and agreeing to hand over their contacts. Is that right? Yeah, well, we've not had a problem reported at all. Fun enough, today I had a meeting with our oversight group for our test, trace, protect system. We've had a very good start to that, partly because we got low numbers. We have less than 100 people each day uh, who are new infections, uh, and we don't have any kind of significant problem with people not giving their data. In the first week of operation, the figures I published with this week, so we had 659 contacts identified. We've acting and that we give advice to 619 of those contacts. That's a contact rate of 94%. And so it does show we've got an effective system here. We've delivered that in partnership between our National Health Service and local authorities to deliver the system. So I think the question really describes a position in England. In Wales, our start has been much more effective than that. And the challenge is how we continue to do that as we progressively unlock more activity when it's safe to do so. So... Here in Wales, I think we have a good story to tell about our start to contact tracing. And I'm very proud of the work that our public servants are doing to deliver that service to help keep Wales safe. Do you agree with that, Liz? Well, we know the fiasco that happened with, with the testing targets in Wales, where they had to be given up on. We actually had to give up on targets because they were so impossible to reach. And I would go back to the question of the, the, the Roche testing con contract, when we, we know that... Uh, Thousands of tests were taken away from Wales by the UK government 
And for some reason or other, I think the people of Wales deserve to hear the full story of this. And yet, uh, I understand, Vaughan, that you're, that you're not releasing the, the actual um, email correspondence that the, was the reason as to why we don't have these tests in Wales. Over and above that, representing a highly rural area, which, of course, is served by Betsy Cadwallader de Health Board, and Betsy Cadwallader de Health Board has been in special measures for five years, what I get people con concerned about with me is that they just can't get the results from their tests back again. So, you know, I'm sad to say that we have these high stories, but when it comes down to people's experience on the ground and that critical way that we need to be getting people's confidence back, they need to see the tests working. That's the only way that's going to unlock people's confidence and then unlock our economy. Well, there's some facts to deal with there, if I may. When it comes to test results in Wales, over 90% of the people get their test results within 48 hours. The idea that this is somehow a widespread problem where late test results simply doesn't match the facts. When it comes to our testing capacity, the review that I ordered into where we were revealed that we couldn't meet those early aspirations about the number of tests we wanted because equipment was delayed in other countries. Some countries stopped the export of testing equipment. We're now in a much better place. We have well over 12,000 tests available daily if we need them in Wales. To give you an idea, if that were equivalent for the whole of the UK, we'd have a UK capacity of well over 260,000 tests. So actually, we have more than if you like the share of the whole UK capacity would be because of the problem that we have successfully implemented. When it comes to turnaround test results, we're actually in a decent place, but I want to see us get better. It will help us to maintain public confidence in test trace and protect if we can turn around those tests even faster. So I'm committed to understanding what we can do to make it better, openly publishing the data we have, and to give that confidence to people. So the facts, I think, don't bear out the comments that Liz has actually made. Okay, just say one uh, thing. Briefly, Liz, because I need to get around the panel. Contact testing was started in Wales and stopped almost immediately. The only place where it carried on was Ceredigion, where they've had the lowest deaths and the lowest rate. I think 61 amongst 100,000 okay. of infection. Let's come back to Shaquille's question. There's also oh, okay. incidents in that county as well, though, Liz. So it isn't a matter of the contact tracing system determining that. And as with every part of the UK, we stopped contact tracing the early part of the pandemic because we simply didn't have the resources to be able to carry on doing that. Now, that's the truth of the matter. I do wish we had greater capacity at an early point in time to allow us to make a different choice. But we made choices with the facts available to us. We're making choices now that are all about how we keep well safe. And we're actually doing a decent job compared to other parts. OK, of let, let me drag us back to Shaquille's question, um, which is talking about the 25,000 contact traces uh, in, the, in, in England, um, with today's test and trace mm. results showing that a third of the people who tested positive are not handing over their contacts to then be traced and, and, and isolate. Is that good enough? Well, I think we can do even more. I mean, let's remember that that meant that two-thirds did the right thing. And of that two-thirds, 85% then confirmed that they would self-isolate. That's over nearly 27,000 people who will now have the benefit of this system. Sure, but what about so the third think, that Shaquille is Well, look, I think he's right to draw our attention to the fact that there are still people who are not cooperating. I think it's... Why do you think uh, that well, is? I'm, I'm concerned about that. I think it's our, all of our collective duty to work with the authorities to do everything we can to do our part. And clearly we've got to get the message over again and again about the importance of uh, sharing that information. Uh, and we share it in a voluntary way, but we do it in a spirit of uh, uh, collective uh, coming together to fight this virus. I think this is only the first week. I know, I just I mentioned it simply because... Encouraging. Well, simply because uh, the minutes that came out from SAVE, which, of course, the scientific body mm. uh, advising the government, said that 80% of contacts need to be traced in order for, for, it to, for this system yeah. to be effective. And if a third of the people aren't handing over their contacts at all, you're not going to get anywhere near that, are you? Yeah, well, well, well we, we need to do better, as I've said. And, and I think that in the first week, that is encouraging. But I very much uh, hope and uh, I would expect that as the, uh, we all get more used to it, then the new normal will start to apply and people will see the advantage in sharing that information and doing the right thing. Uh, because cumulatively, uh, as we found with lockdown, we can use this system to continue the fight against the virus. Ross. Hello, sorry. Do you reckon, Rob, uh, do you think there's a correlation between the confidence in how the government's dealt with this pandemic 
and connecting that with the third that doesn't give any of their details with the track and trace. I love the fact that Ross is calling you Rob as well. We're getting a fantastic informer here. <laughs> That's all right, Ross. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of people do. Um, I, think, I think it's a very important point. I, I talked about confidence, I think, but do you think he's, Do you think he's right? I, I think that uh, we've got to ask ourselves the question. Uh, are, are people doing it because they don't want to cooperate, that they, they value perhaps their own privacy? Or lost or, trust, or that's what Ross is asking. are they saying... Well, I'm, and I'm trying to deal with the point. I, I think that there is still, actually, from uh, all the evidence that I'm seeing, a high degree of... Uh, not so much, uh, I mean, people just doing it because the government are telling them to do it. People doing it because they know from their own... Uh, information and their own research and their own understanding that it is the right thing to do. And, you know, I never underestimated the uh, the sense of the uh, the Welsh public or the British public to do the right thing. Uh, you will always okay. have a minority, perhaps, who won't, but the majority can be trusted. And frankly, rather than blind trust in government, government should be trusting people to do the right thing. Or are That's they very asking... much my approach. Uh, okay. What would Dominic Cummings do? OK. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's talk you know, about individuals now, uh, Liz. Let's raise the level of the debate. Let me we? get round the rest of, of the panel. Bernadine, what do you make of what you're hearing? <laughs> I don't I don't know. I think there is a privacy issue, and I do think there's a trust issue. Actually, I kind of agree with Ross, because I certainly haven't taken my lead from this government in terms of the pandemic. I went into lockdown uh, some 10 days before the government told me to, because it was glaringly obvious to me that I should do and, and I probably I might have saved my life I don't know because I, I zap around London on a tube all the time and uh, the, the week before I went into lockdown the, the, the tube was heaving people were mm. coughing and spluttering and sniffing and it was terrible and I do know people who continued to travel around London who got the virus mm. you know so I did not take my leadership from this government and, and we know about Boris and, and, and him shaking hands with coronavirus patients in a hospital when we all knew that you shouldn't be making contact, physical contact with people. And he, he did later say that he was, he was shaking hands with, with the staff. He, he made the point. Oh, he did he? Yes, okay. he wasn't shaking hands well, with well, patients. Well, the thing is, that's what he said. Or that's what we, we perceived him to say. So, so, so that was his leadership. So um, I, I think people are very suspicious. And um, I think people are making up their own minds about what they're going to do and not necessarily listening to the government. And we have to bring up Cummings, who I'm sure is brought up a lot in this programme, because, you know, he's... He well, is... certainly was at the time, yes. There was quite well, a lot of yeah, conversation so, about you know, it. He, look, at, look at his leadership skills, you know, although he's the man behind the throne. He's the puppet master. But, but we know what he did. So um, it's a very difficult situation. It's very difficult for people. Who, who do you listen to? Tired. Uh, testing is one thing, tr tracking is another one, but it's the speed of results of the test which is mm. important. Um, I was desperate to get back to work when I was tested, but it took three days for my results to come back. I was desperate because I knew I was needed in work. Mm. But when you hear stories like getting your eyes tested by driving certain amount of uh, miles, and the lack of leadership. Uh, fortunate to have uh, one getting here. Yes, majority of people might get their results, but for healthcare workers, I think it's important that the speed of uh, reporting should be quicker. Not only that, the results and the statistics that we uh, look for, we need to have those results quicker. We need to learn from Korea, where the results come in within a day and then the track and testing uh, uh, process is much faster with isolation. So we needed to learn much quicker from Korea and other countries who have dealt with it rather than wait for lack of leadership and not condemning what uh, uh, the Prime Minister's aide did or uh, the other ingredients within the whole uh, 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 recipe of uh, protecting people. I feel much safer with this two-meter rule over here uh, but then the lack of PP hearing uh, stories and the report coming uh, out about ethnic minority doctors, mm -hmm. why they're dying more than the others. These are the issues that we need to have clear recommendations to make sure that we are moving in the right direction. We need to protect, protect each and every life that we can. Of course, of course, not just doctors, it was all healthcare staff. Uh, Rocco. 
Well, it's very, it's very peculiar this uh, this virus, and it doesn't it doesn't affect everybody in the same way. The week before I emerged with the the symptoms, which was actually coincided with uh, with lockdown, I worked cheek by jowl with six senior executives in my office uh, um, because we were getting you know, we said that we were planning for the for the the issues that we had to face. And none of them got the disease. In my household, with it, which has 11 people and two children, and we were all together in it, only four people got the, uh, got the disease. And what happened? Why didn't the others catch it? And so it's, it, 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 I think a lot of the, a lot of the, the, um, the, um, the modeling that's, that's taking place is based on assumptions that are completely, that are completely wrong. And, uh, the, 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 I mean, it is a new disease, of course. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, I, yes, but I mean, you know, the five, I mean, uh, uh, the, the 500,000 deaths were based on, on a computer model, completely false assumptions. Uh, probably... Well, I'm not the sure that Neil Ferguson shares that view, but yes. ...that we would have had if we locked down the area. The same, as, the same wrong assumptions have been put into the computer model. Why should we believe them? But, Rocco, forgive me, this, is, this, this, this illness is not known to science for more than perhaps six months. We cannot say for certain how it will pan out. No, we make I mean, our best lot, assessments a lot of, under the A lot of the, uh, you know, this whole two, two, two metre distance is based principally on the Spanish flu. The, the second wave is based on the Spanish flu, a completely different disease to this. The last two coronaviruses have petered out on their own, and this and probably will happen with this one. Well, that would be marvellous if that were the case. I'm not sure that there is certainty on that. Far from it, I think, Rocco, but thank you. We are out of time, which is why I'm... I'm Closing you down on that, I'm afraid. Our hour is up. Tonight, our questioners came from Cardiff. Uh, but next week, we'll have an audience from Plymouth. And then the week after that, we're doing a special programme for the under-30s. Uh, a special programme, and no doubt they will have a lot to say on a whole range of issues that affect their lives. Talked about the economy, uh, jobs, housing, lifestyle, and, of course, the effects of coronavirus, which will uh, affect their futures as well as everyone else's. So we're taking audience applications for that uh, now from across the UK, not just from one part of the UK. So do apply in the usual uh, way at the Question Time website. And just before that, of course, don't forget Plymouth. Uh, we'd like to hear from people there, whatever age you are, of course. And if you want to carry on tonight's discussion, as always, you can join Adrian Charles and guests on Question Time Extra Time, and that is on Five Live right now. But for now, thank you very much to the panel for coming into the studio, uh, to Vaughan for joining us down the line, and of course to our virtual audience joining us from Cardiff. Love to see you. Thank you, all of you. And of course, thank you at home for watching from Question Time. Bye-bye. The people who took ill are so...